What I'd like to do today is to take some time to talk about uh, elements of delivery that all people should consider when they're giving presentations or they're in an interview situation or in any face-to-face -face encounter. Uh, there's an interesting study that came out recently, but theoretically, Judy Burgoon talked about that a lot of communication, 60 to 65% is actually nonverbal. So oftentimes people are paying more attention to how you are saying something and how you are presenting than they are the actual material. So while I could keep you busy for a few hours here, what I would like to do is take the next 20 minutes to think about basic principles of delivery that anybody should be thinking about as they want to become a more effective and influential communicator. All right, so with that, uh, I'd like, as we kind of start this lecture, uh, really just to open it up to the audience members. And I want everybody at any point, if you have any questions or you'd like a clarification, to feel free to jump in because I really want this to be an interactive sort of um, presentation. All right, so let's start with a little theory. I won't bore you with theory, but it's important to have a little. Um, if you think about Gonzaga and its Ignatian ethos, one of the things that's been central to uh, a Gonzaga as a education is to be a good communicator. And a lot of Jesuit philosophy is based in Aristotle. And there is a lot of Aristotle that is relevant to public speaking. So what I'm going to talk about here are just some basic ideas that really ground the principles of delivery. So if you look at Aristotle's ethos, pathos, and logos, and I'll explain those in a moment, this provides a really good orientation for how you as a presenter might want to think about being more effective. So according to Aristotle, and it's well documented as well theoretically, in order to be effective, you have to have a good ethos, and you have to use pathos and logos as well. Ethos is basically made up of three components. Some people say five, but I'm going to say three for our purposes. And that is, ethos is made up of competence, integrity, and rapport, or goodwill. So competence, obviously, is communicated shows that you know what you're talking about. You're confident as a presenter. You seem to have expertise. Integrity, obviously, is that you are trustworthy. And rapport and goodwill is that you're likable and you want to relate to the audience. So we see multiple examples of this in our society of speakers who at one time were very trustworthy and very credible and maybe very competent. But their integrity was compromised. People no longer trusted them, so now they are no longer effective presenters, even if they have all of those other components. So coming across as knowing what you're talking about, feeling confident, being trustworthy, and likable is basically the, way to, the best way to think about ethos. Pathos is emotional appeal. So that is, rather than being dry, you are being engaging. You're connecting at an emotional level with the audience. Sometimes you're telling a poignant story that's powerful emotionally. And again, that's a very effective way to be persuasive. And then finally, logos would be logical argument. Okay. So having cre credible facts, knowing your audience and gearing your material that way. So with that, that's sort of a theoretical context with, with, within which we'll go ahead. And these principles are actually fairly basic and straightforward, which is one of the reasons I love teaching public speaking as opposed to advanced statistics. But uh, they're not simplistic. And there's a lot of subtlety around how to be really effective in thinking about these elements of delivery and then employing them. So as we just talked about with ethos, competence, integrity, and rapport, And the first and foremost component that I'd like to talk about has to do with eye contact. So if, for example, I have my notes in front of me and I say, Aristotelian ethos is an important theoretical foundation for understanding public speaking. It is made up of competence, integrity, and rapport. What am I communicating to you through my eye contact? Amy. Amy. That's correct. I do not know my material. So 
automatically by simply directing my eye contact to notes, I am communicating very strongly to you that I am not competent. Okay, so again, that's a pretty sort of critical piece there. So what I'd like to talk about as well then is what about likability, integrity, and rapport? In this particular culture, in, in American mainstream culture, eye contact conveys honesty. It conveys trustworthiness. We've been taught at a young age, look me in the eye when I talk to you. Look me in the eye when you tell me this. So again, it's a pretty critical piece. In many cultures, direct eye contact can be viewed as confrontational and disrespectful. But in our culture, and especially a corporate culture, eye contact is a pretty important component of effective delivery. So again, when you're thinking about that, it establishes rapport, it conveys trustworthiness, and it conveys competence. So as you think about that as a speaker, how do you be more aware of eye contact? For example, in the audience, if Cindy's looking at her watch, rolling her eyes, when is this thing going to end? That's not positive for me as the uh, speaker, right? So it's a natural tendency for me to want to avoid looking at Cindy because I am not getting warm support. I'm getting punished in this. I'm going to look at Lisa because I'm getting warm support from her. However, if my eye contact goes to a particular part of the audience and I focus mainly on that part, or I am in a boardroom and somebody asks me a question and I subconsciously look at the person that I think has the power in the room, that can have a very negative effect. So one of the things you want to try to do is really be cognizant of spreading your eye contact around the room. And I've just got a very simple principle that you can follow. So if you look too long at a particular individual, that just gets kind of weird, right? Uh, <laughs> If you're scanning or you're not purposeful or your eyes are going up as if you're trying to recall something, that also sort of disrupts your confidence and potential competence. So one of the basic rules that I use is very simple. When I walk into a room, be it a boardroom or I'm in an interview, I will immediately sort of scan my audience and know here's, here's where my audience is sitting. And I'm going to tell myself, I need to look at everyone in the audience. And so I just use a very basic technique. And I'll slow it down for you. What I do, comma, is allow the structure of the sentence, comma, to help direct where my eye contact is going, period. The audience doesn't know this, but it ends up looking more natural and more connective to everybody else. And regardless of whether I'm getting this really negative feedback from an audience member or real, some very positive feedback, I'm not going to let that affect me. I'm going to be relational to the audience. So again, just a really sort of basic principle to use. And I can tell you from experience, I've sat on a lot of interviews before and I've had candidates in the room that have not been effective with their eye contact. They have subconsciously ignored certain people in the room, and it does not make a good impression. They are typically not hired. So really, really important to think about this. The next element to think about is projection, and that is essentially the volume of your voice. So a really good speaker is able to modulate the tone and volume of their voice. Right now I'm mic'd and I'm in a fairly small room with an audience fairly close to me. So I am using a more normal conversational tone. However, I have been in rooms where the mic has failed and I've had 40 people in the room and I need to be able to project my voice, to be aware of that volume. In addition, sometimes for rhetorical effect, for energy and enthusiasm, a raised volume conveys more power, more authority potentially, or more charisma. Other times, a very soft approach is the most effective. And one of the reasons I bring up projection is because of the hundreds and hundreds of students I've taught, a lot of people really struggle with this. They're giving a presentation and they think they are actually yelling. And in fact, their volume is way too small, uh, way too quiet. So essentially, again, thinking about projection and the volume of your voice is something that projects, again, from the Aristotelian perspective, 
It projects competence, confidence, and likability and rapport. The next sort of component to think about is your rate, the rate of your speech. And I do this for a couple of reasons. When we are giving presentations, we tend to be more nervous. I had a little caffeine a little earlier, uh, nice coffee, get my adrenaline's going, big audience here. So I'm, my, my blood pressure is a little higher and I'm definitely more nervous than I normally am. What naturally happens is that we tend to potentially speed up. We speed up subconsciously without knowing it. And that, in addition, sort of takes away from your ethos. So being conscious about slowing down your rate, making use of pauses, thinking about your cadence is something, again, to pay attention to. It's one of the biggest things that I had to work on as well. Because conversational speed typically is faster than it should be when you're giving a presentation or you're being more formal. So again, just being aware of rate in addition to these other things is important. Inflection, that is the tone of your voice. And I have very good news here. So if you were trained to be a speaker 40, 50 years ago, you would be trained much like broadcasters and DJs are today. So whether you go to Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, Philadelphia, you listen to the radio, most of those DJs have a similar cadence, right? As do broadcasters. That is well trained. And public speakers used to be trained in this way as well. But when we think about this now, the best speakers are speakers that are conversational. If you see a really good TED talk, those speakers are very polished, but they're coming across very authentically. So a really good speech should just be a polished conversation. And the more you can be authentic, the more you can be yourself, the more you come across as trustworthy and likable. And the other great news is you can make all kinds of mistakes as a speaker. But if you come across as authentic, that people trust you and you're telling your story, that they will be very, very forgiving. If you come across as canned, and sort of inauthentic, no matter how polished you might be, you're not going to be as effective as a speaker. So again, there's a lot of things we could talk about, but these are just some basics that if you work on, you will really take your game upstairs. And the, this part that I'd like to talk about really has to do with body language and posture. Again, thinking that so much of good communication is nonverbal, you communicate a lot by how your body language operates. So for example, if you're putting your hands in your pockets, if you've got a lot of distracting leg movements that you may not be consciously aware of, that just because you're kind of nervous and you're completely unaware of these things, again, that's communicating sort of a lack of confidence and a lack of competence. So a really good way to think about this, and again, it's fairly basic, in a public speaking situation, you should be sort of facing your audience. At times, turning your body slightly so that you're inclusive to everybody in the room. But in addition to that, standing up straight, avoiding weight leans. It just conveys a, a, a calm, sort of assertive presence. If you're in a boardroom or you're in an interview situation, typically you're asked a question you want to turn to that person and not just your head, but you sort of turn your body as well. You lean in slightly, you make eye contact, you answer the question as you're looking around to the rest of the room. And all of these things, again, seem very, very basic, but taken together, sort of the gestalt of all of these things, really can make you appear as a much more confident speaker. And so with that then, I would like to open it up for questions if anybody has any or comments, or thinking about your own experiences in this regard. I have a question. Yes. How do you avoid the common mistake that we all make with the uhs and the ums? Do you have any tips or tricks, those space fillers? Yeah, yes, it's a really good question that you ask. So when I was, I lived in Japan for six years. And when I was there, I was confounded by some words that people use. I could not find them in the dictionary, and they were used very often. It was eto, ano, anone, etone. Couldn't figure it out. 
it was um and uh. So every <laughs> language has these sort of vocalized pauses. And occasionally it's fine. However, if you have, if you're saying um and ah uh and like and you know all the time, again, it's very disruptive. So we did a study a few years ago and uh, got it, it, it got it published. It was a rigorous study. We took, and this was teaching undergraduates at Gonzaga. We took a control group and we just gave them verbal feedback on the number of fillers and tallied the number of ums and us students used. Incoming freshmen, three to five minute speech, I am not kidding you. On a few students, I counted 60 to 70 ums in a three to five minute speech. So what we did in the experimental group is we had a little, like just Pavlovian conditioning. Anytime during the speech, the speaker said, um, there'd be a tap of a coin on the table. And it very quickly teaches you to be aware of that. Now, not only did that really work, it was shown compared to the control group to be effective, other people learned vicariously from that. So any sort of behavior you want to become more aware of, you can work very quickly and very easily by just having somebody, for example, if your rate speeds up too much, you can just have somebody tap and that tells you to slow it down. And uh, it is highly effective, although rather unpleasant, but it works really, really well. <laughs> Again, making, your, making these behaviors become part of conscious awareness is the best way to sort of overcome them. Yeah, Cindy. Question. Frequently you're in a situation where you are seated and having to have, like, especially in an interview setting, mm -hmm. having a conversation. What kinds of tips would you have for that? Because you're not able to, to have that same, maybe it's still sitting up straight, but body language and those sorts of things when you're in a seated position. So I'd say what you are doing right now is fine. You're fronting, you're sort of, your posture is centered on me, you're making eye contact, you're nodding you're using gestures. Uh, for the most part, it's just being aware of your body language and not doing things that are distracting. One of the things that comes up because I study anxiety is that when you have a sympathetic nervous system activation, which is a fight or flight response, different people respond differently. So higher order functioning sort of goes out the window. So some people, their mouth gets really, really dry. Other people, they get uh, it's more, I see this more with women than men, they get really splotchy in here. They get sort of flushed. So one of the things to be aware of is that if you're going for an interview and that tends to happen where something that's a little higher necked there, um, in terms of body language, it's just sort of the same principle seated. Fronting the person, being confident, competent, making eye contact, appearing as authentic. Sure. Yes? Do you have a recommendation on what to do with your hands? That's the one thing I can never figure out. Yes. So, yes. And if you're coming from a Southern Italian culture or a Latino culture, a lot of gesticulation. Anglicized culture tends to be a little more subdued. Japanese culture, very subdued in terms of gestures. Again, my thought on this would to be, it is to be yourself. And the more sort of authentic and relaxed you appear, the better. And then just to become aware of it, just to say, I think I have these very distracting hand movements. You ask a friend or a colleague in sort of a mock or preparation situation to look at your gestures. There are certain things you can do more formally in a presentation, using illustrators, those sorts of things, or referring to the board. But for the most part, I just say, be yourself. And again, if you're coming across as uh, authentic and natural, it's going to be effective. Yeah, John. Related to the hands question, I've heard that um, in a seated position, ha when your hands are not visible to your audience, does that convey something versus making your hands just even visible, even if you're not doing anything with them? Yeah, and that's a really good point. Y your hands should be visible. So again, the po it's it's potentially hiding something subconsciously is is conveying potentially nervousness, an avoidant situation, and a lot of, uh, say, counter-espionage agents pay attention to those subtle changes as well. So you may be talking about something, and a lot of times people that are interrogators that are non-verbal non experts will go from hot topics to cold topics. So they'll just ask you about your family and what you did, and then they'll ask about that ice pick that was used in the murder. And uh, I'm not kidding. <laughs> And if they start to see changes that take place, oftentimes out of conscious awareness, that's always an indicator of 
okay, we need to follow up with this particular piece. So again, hands on the table is a really, really good idea rather than being closed or under the table. Yes? So that's a great question. I've had that happen a couple of times. <laughs> so I like the quote, I think it's from Shakespeare, luck favors the prepared mind. So up here today, I didn't have any notes. I've, I know these concepts pretty well, but I have my PowerPoint. So if, for example, I forgot something, I can always just reorient looking at the PowerPoint. I really think if you're unprepared, you're always rolling the dice. So it's natural to feel nervous at times. And again, your point is well taken. When you get a fight or flight response, higher cognitive functioning goes out the window. So memory goes out the window when you've got adrenaline and cortisol and blood rushing into your outer extremities. So it's a possibility to forget. A remedy is to have note cards at times. You can have those. People are very forgiving about these things. So preparation, some redundancy in place, and if you get really nervous and stop, you just sigh, take a pause, and continue onward. And again, the more you do this, uh, the better you become at it despite the anxiety.